You know, many times I think I'm responsible to do the talk and what will I talk about? And it always comes just what I want to talk about. It always comes and it always sort of evolves through the week. It's like it's in the back of my mind. And then I'll say, oh, yes, um, I want to say this. And each time it feels like something important to say that I want to, to discuss with you, that I want to bring the family around the table for us to talk about. I was uh, so heartened by Nico's talk last time and the way that she brought up the social political uh, context <clears throat> into, into the dialogue. And I wanted to extend that today. The way that I want to extend it is to, to think about with you what, um, what Jean calls the more, that the more is always there in our focusing, right? The whole of something. And the whole of something, the more of something uh, is almost infinite and, and uh, much of it, most of it, um, except for a teeny weeny wee bit is, is implicit. It's there, but we don't think about it. We don't think it. And the life experience that's embedded in the political situation, the time, that one is uh, in, the place that one is in, the uh, zeitgeist that one is in, is, is all, of course, part of that more of the felt sense. And I wanted to think about with you um, Jean's personal experience and how that is also a context for, um, for focusing and for the felt sense, for his contribution to the world. From the time, and, and, and I wanna say that that's a delicate subject in a way, because Jean was not that eager to talk about his own life experience and his escape from the Nazis. There's a beautiful uh, description that he gave um, in an interview that I have in the, in the chat now. Christine will um, make sure that you have that. Um, and and you will, if you haven't read it, you'll find it fascinating, absolutely fascinating to read. And uh, as I would visit Jane, little pieces of his experience would come out. Like uh, I would bring him food and, um, and he asked for um, the herring, a particular kind of salty herring. <laughs> I see smiles. <laughs> and I actually found that at Russendorf in the back room. I asked, I thought they'll never have it. They did have it. And, and Jean was just so touched that I brought him this. It was almost like tears in his eyes and he, every taste he would go, um, oh. And it was, he said, the taste of freedom because when he arrived in Holland, they sold that kind of fish. It was poor people's food. They would have it in, in barrels on the street and, um, and they would we would give it to you in a piece of newspaper, and you would buy the this um, these pieces of herring. And so I, I got the in in between things. I got the flavor of what was uh, Jean's history and life and importance. But he was never willing to talk to talk about it with me on on video. Um, which I, I wanted him to, because he said, I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for focusing for my ideas, for my philosophy. I don't want to be known for my life experience. 
And that was sort of interesting to me. I couldn't understand it at the time until I, I sort of recognized, well, the story of his escape is so dramatic and amazing. And he was uh, afraid that he would be reduced to that story, that he would be known for that rather than, um, rather than for what he most cared about, like for his contribution. From our point of view, or from my point of view this morning, talking about his life experience is not about reducing him to that or to anything, but it's about uh, the, the, the context, the personal political context in which his contribution of the, the felt sense grew. And so we're taking it in that spirit. So it's delicate for me because I think, well, it, it, would Gene like the way I'm talking about it? Is this faithful to his, to his experience? Um, but he would say, I have a, a well-developed inner Gene Genlin, and I'm sure many of you have inner Gene Genlins <laughs> that speak to you. My my inner Gene Genlin says, "Oh, don't worry about that. I, you know, I was, you know, I was." worried about that when I was alive, but now here in this vastness, um, you know, once you make your contribution, it's there for the world and the world does what it does and the life force moves through it. And, and Jean is, is reassuring me that it's okay. So I'm gonna take a breath here. <sighs> From the moment that I met Jean, and I think many of you who knew him felt this way. There was something so um, unique. Of course, every human being is unique, but something so kind of amazing about him. I knew at the moment that I met him in this workshop that I wanted to study with him and that, he, that he, what he had to offer was the answer to what I was looking for which was a glue that would hold all of the things that I was studying together. It wasn't only the content, but it was the lived experience of Gene. The content and his way of being were, were one. And his, his way of being was remarkable the kind of presence and endless curiosity and desire to connect and the, the vastness and depth of his scope. He, he had, and again, many of you know this uh, by experience, an uncanny combination of confidence and humility. The confidence was he knew that what he was showing and teaching and living was vastly important and that it was right. And no matter what anybody else in the philosophical community might find fault with it in various ways that all philosophers find fault with, all other philosophies, that was unshakable to him, that confidence. He had the confidence not only to think outside the box and to live outside the box, but to deconstruct the boxes themselves and say, what are these boxes? How can we see them? What do they mean? Why do we have them? What good are they? What is it to think outside the box? And many of you have gotten that um, from Gene, either directly or indirectly from his teaching. Uh, I think it was Dorothy last time in our planning meeting said that all of the presentations have in common, even though all our presentations are so varied, that they all have in common the spirit of 
what does this mean to you? How does this live in you? And the supreme authority of one's own knowing and the and the lived experience of it being a different kind of knowing that isn't only a rational knowing an academic knowing it's not just knowledge it's that deep knowing that goes out to our connectedness to everything so I want to say, how did, how, how did Jean come by these, this confidence? And then it was mixed with this incredible humility. You know, when he writes about um, if the client wants to see this shaky substance that he is in his eyes, he doesn't hide it. There was another word, a shaky something. Somebody else will know that quote. Um, he didn't hide his insecurity. He didn't hide his uh, vulnerability. He didn't hide his shyness, and and uh, and that he never he never felt himself to be above anybody else. Everyone had this deep knowing in them. And then he had this um, confidence that if you deeply listen to people, they become wise and beautiful. They get past the defensive reactivity or smallness that they, defensiveness that they may initially have. And that you, when you listen, you go right to that part that goes way out to everything. He had confidence in that and he never felt that he was above anybody else or he felt like he knew, he, he felt like he, he knew more in, a, in, a, in an argument. He would feel like, well, I know, I know. And, and, um, but not that, that that was a better knowing. Um, one little little side thing here is that uh, that uh, Jean was first my therapist and then and then teacher and then uh, and then colleague. And when I <clears throat> became um, more uh, colleagues with him, he was also teaching me how to how to debate, how to argue. So we would argue about things and then he would take my side. He would say, well, I think it's blah, 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 blah. But you might say, um, and he would help me with my side of it. And I love that. What a wonderful way to mentor someone is to help them to argue against your own ideas. And uh, that was a quality of, I wanna say voracious, anti-authoritarianism, the, ther the therapist-client relationship or the teacher-student relationship is asymmetrical, but it's totally mutual. And that's of course part of the political social context that he is inviting us um, to, to consider with him that Nico talked about last time. So I want to say what enabled him to have these qualities. And then I want to talk about his experience. But that smacks of reductionism, doesn't it? As if his experience of escaping the Nazis, his experience of living in an old world and a new world, his time of history, that it reduces his thinking to that. And of course, it doesn't. So it's not cause and effect, but it's the context. When, when uh, Gene was a young man, and I've quoted this often because I love this, um, and people asked him in graduate school, which philosophies do you want to study? You know, Sartre, whoever. 
uh, he would, and, and he said, um, I love all of these philosophies, but I don't want to study the philosophies. I want to understand how they got these philosophies. I want to go to the larger realm at the edge of their thinking. Larger realm at the edge of thinking. I have a visual image of this and some of the artists in this group might find a picture or, or draw a picture of it going right to that edge of the vastness, right to the edge of where thinking stops, which is a little different than meditation where we're in the vastness, but just that edge where the, where the implicit and explicit um, meet, where there's a dialogue between the implicit and explicit. So I, I put in the chat this beautiful uh, interview of Gene about his escape to the Nazis and those escape from the Nazis. And those of you who haven't read it will really enjoy reading it. And I want us to consider how that life experience contributed to Gene's um, lifelong immersion in studying the felt sense. First, the thing that strikes me about this, uh, about this story, and I'd love to know what strikes you about it, is the complexity of the situation of um, Vienna in those days. Um, of the, the many who were anti-Nazi and the many that were for, it, it reminds me of, of, of the dividedness of um, the United States um, in, the, in the times of, uh, of uh, Trump. Um, and many, um, many so anti and many so for. Um, and the complexity of the, the times changing. Um, what struck me was that, that Jean's life, uh, middle-class life was, was very ordered, um, uh, embedded in, in Jewish tradition. He was, um, he was uh, bar mitzvahed. His father was an engineer. The little details of the story strike me that when the Nazis took over, invaded Vienna, his father was coming home from a conference. And then almost immediately arrested. And the little detail of how he and his mother brought toothpaste and underwear to his father in jail the detail of, of how his father wanted to make sure he didn't think that uh, his arrest had anything to do with him and took him on a long walk, explaining to him about these arrests. And Gene's connection with his father. He knew so much more about what his father was trying to do and say and he was so coordinated with his father through the ha harrowing escape of all of the details. He would watch his father's face and, and get the sense of what his father was doing. It struck me the detail about, and I, I think we may read a tiny bit of that, the crossing the border and his father getting out of the train to get Jean lemonade because he always wanted to take care of Jean. And the, and the um, Gestapo coming into the train just at that moment. 
and and not finding him there. I think we'll we'll read that little snippet. Um, there was a, a a detail that Jean talked about that isn't in this interview about a, a woman in their neighborhood who uh, they they thought of as a saint because she didn't try to escape herself. She tried to help all of the people who needed to, to escape, all the Jews that needed to escape, to find uh, ways to do it. Uh, all of the complex paths of ways that you could navigate getting out of there. The detail of how there were, were uh, like 40 documents that you needed to get at different offices and, and the and the lines going around and around the block to wait for these documents. And of course, the, the place where the story touches us most is how Gene watched his father navigate through this maze of decisions, paying attention to his feelings, his father called it, and who he could trust and who he couldn't trust, where to go and how to do it. And Jean saying, what kind of feeling is this that can tell you what to do? So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Stuart to read this little part for us now we went to Cologne by train. In Regenberg, my father got out to buy some lemonade. There was no one else in our compartment, just me and my mother. Two men in gray suits came in. They showed their documents, said Gestapo, and asked, where is Dr. Jendler? We said we did not know. The train started to move and the two men got out. Soon my father came back from the carriages at the back where he had entered the train again. He had not seen them. He did not know anything about them. My dear parents who always wanted to give me everything, the lemonade had saved us. We were still afraid, but we did not hear any more from the Gestapo. Stuart, skip down now to the part about we found the right house. We found the right house in an apartment on the upper floor. There my father went into a room with a man and I waited maybe for a quarter of an hour. When my father came out, he was pale and said, let's go. Outside he explained that he could not trust this man. My father said that his feeling had said no to him. My father had already said this many times, I follow my feeling. But at this time, I did not understand what he meant when he said he trusted his feelings. We were in a strange city and without any way out. We had put all our hopes on the address and now this hope was destroyed only because of what he said he felt. I was surprised then and also asked often myself later what kind of feeling it must be that tells you something. Sometimes I tried to find such a feeling within myself, but I could not. But then, but then I started to look for it, had its effect in the end. 40 years later, when I was asked how I could explain focusing, I remembered these circumstances. Dean spent his whole life that question, what kind of feeling is this that touches into the larger realm at the edge of thinking? I mentioned last week that part in the movie about um, Harriet Tubman where she prays her way of going to that larger realm and sees which way to cross the river, not, the, not over the bridge, but another way, which was very illogical to the people she was with. What kind of feeling is this that can put us in touch with this more 
this vast moor, and with the immediacy of our own decision making, can put us in touch with the deeply intricate, intimate, personal, and interpersonal, and the vast complexity of the time, the, the every one, the big systems that can guide us and that can put us in a different place, the, this kind of feeling that changes our channel to that open, large channel of being part of the whole great big everything. So I'd love to hear after we take a breath, just what strikes you about the story and about this feeling that Jean has given us a better understanding of. He didn't invent, invent the felt sense, right? His father certainly knew it. Many people have known it all through history, but he's taught us so much about finding it and using it and the ways of it. So let's take a breath together. Okay, I am so eager to hear from you. Whatever is there for you now is welcome. So um, what strikes me is how in a sense, without being reductionist, his whole life was a carrying forward. Mm. This connection to his father's connection mm. felt sense. Mm -hmm. And there's something about his connection to his father um, that I'm right at the edge of and I can't, I can't, I don't have words yet. Maybe some little part of that connection he had with his father, we have with him, or we have with the ones that taught us focusing, or we have with many others, as a knowing beyond knowing, a feel of the other that imparts their wisdom to us. To me, it's more a sense of responsibility for getting another person to that edge, but knowing very well that they have their own life to live. Mm. But within the, the confines of the interaction between yourself and the other, there's the sense of allowing them just by your presence to be themselves, truly themselves. I'm also thinking about trauma mm. and knowing that somehow trauma brings, can bring you right into the felt sense. Mm. And thinking about um, an experience I had as a teenager that made me very aware of my felt sense around danger. Mm. And um, to really trust that. I couldn't define it as felt sense at that time. Uh, but I think that that's, that's what it can, you know, bring you to is, is that very strong sense in there. Absolutely. Right. This alertness to, uh, to what you can't uh, logically think or, or see, but you're so aware. Yes. Um, this is Doug. I thank you, Lenore. I appreciate that. I was thinking about a client I saw a few days ago, a trauma client, and uh, 
And this really uh, seems to relate to the feeling um, of the other person um, that imparts their wisdom. And I had this interesting experience with this uh, young lady where I felt like our communication was, um, had gone beyond words. I was, I think I was receiving more from her that the words couldn't even uh, capture or even keep up with and um, vice versa. It somehow there was a whole nother level of communication going on that I'd really not experienced that before. And it seems that this is kind of related to that somehow. Absolutely, yes. And I think that that um, kind of experience, that that, that that kind of communication is always going on, but we are not so aware of it. We aren't aware of it. But uh, in, in specific cases, we become aware of it. And then it's like, oh, that dimension is always there. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not, we're not, tuned into it. What I find interesting about what Doug said is that even though we may not be tuned into it, if someone else is, it draws us into it. Yes, yes, yes. When the, when the helper can be tuned into it, then the, the helpies get tuned into it. But sometimes it's the other way around that the helpies are tuned into it and it helps us helpers to come into it, they bring us into it, like with Doug. Well, I'm struck by all the years that I knew Gene that I didn't know this history of his. And, 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 I, and I'm really curious, because, and, and I need to know more why, you know, he, he was reluctant to share this with the world. Um, because for me, it would have been such an easier entree into focusing just that little paragraph or two Mm -hmm. um, because it would have sort of confirmed what I've known all along. And having read that, it would really help me learn focusing, I think, in a different way or a smoother way or confirming what I already knew. Yes, yeah. I couldn't understand it either. But then the way that I understood it is that I, uh, I'm visually handicapped and I was born with this uh, eye condition. And I never want to associate, I, I never want to be known as the person who writes papers and does talks who's visually handicapped. Because uh, then I think that I don't, I don't want that to be my identity. And I, I feel like it was something sort of like that for Gene, that he didn't want this escape from the Nazis to be his identity. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm trying to just make sense of it myself and yet we're so much of our histories you know that's how we go forward actually so, absolutely yeah, it's, and, and gene certainly knew that and believed that uh, I'm, a, I'm a child of, of eastern european jews and I was, it wasn't until i was 50 years old and went to ellis island that i read about the slaughter of my ancestors and Russian pogroms. It's just, it's just normal, uh, I think. I don't know if it's just the United States or the story of refugees that the stories get, you know, or World War II veterans who children never heard their stories. And yeah, yeah, what's moving to me, you know, I, I, I'm, I feel like a, a novice in the focusing culture in terms of not really having understood what thinking at the edge is really all about. And uh, uh, <laughs> it's the, very, the very simple language that you brought in today, Lynn, in the context of this particular story, uh, for me, just is, is clarifying and penetrating right it's like here here's gene and his individual self learning how to you know uh kind of calibrate his navigate internal navigation system in relationship to the world there's his father on the edge of his field right you know helping him you know see how to tune and there's his father you know relating to the wider field you know you know, in your language before and there on the edge of the implicit and the explicit, right? So, you know, such a beautiful story of being kind of partnered 
in the way that we can be, you know, for a client holding the space. And then there's the mystery of what's the inner and what's the outer, right? Because they kind of it's all that. together. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you, Stuart. I I think so too that this story helps us to it, it sort of anchors something about this felt sense that Jean was seeking. The the other thing that, that I notice about it is that um, Jean as, a, as a, a trauma survivor has this incredible faith in the universe that every bit of human experience has an implicit forward movement inherent in it. The, the story sort of shows that that the, the feelings, uh, William James called them feelings of tendency. The feelings opened up to new, to new pathways. And there's a faith that if we pay attention to our feelings, that there will be a way. It doesn't mean that we won't suffer, maybe even that we won't die, but that it opens up to, um, to a larger realm. And that was his experience of these feelings. The other thing that I notice around that is that, you know, it would be so natural for, for Jean to um, have a philosophy of, of dividing people into the good people and, and the evil people. And there, there's none of that in, in Jean's thinking. It's always much more complicated than that. The interweaving of, um, of rightness and wrongness. Always potential in everything for seeing the, the deeper place where life is trying to happen. He uh, was one of the people that, that I've known personally, one of the few people that I've known personally that didn't have a bifurcation system in him. It was always uh, the complexity. I think what you just said, Lynn, um, really spoke to what I've been thinking as we've, as we've talked this morning, that... Um, that, that what my felt sense tells me about another person, for instance, may not be pertinent to anyone else. That the person I'm warned against may not be someone else's uh, bete noir, you know, that, um, <clears throat> in all sorts of other ways. And so that is that complexity that you can't, and it's also the anti-authoritarianism um, at work that there isn't a right answer. There's your answer and it may also change day to day. Absolutely, minute by minute when we're focusing with someone that the, at, at one moment they'll say, this is the answer, this is right. That person I'm dating is just a, a narcissist and I have to get rid of him. And, and that's the truth. And it is in that moment. And then two sentences later might be, but, but there's this look in his eyes that I see something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it changes moment to moment. Um, Jean believed deeply that there is truth, that there is rightness, um, and that there's wrongness. But, but the rightness is something not that is static. The rightness is something that's always moving and developing. And the rightness is something that we live in, that we can touch, but it's not solid and changeless. What I learned from you, Lynn, uh, in that talk you gave this morning was that I always thought it was my mother who had that, you know, the ability and stuff like that. Now I'm saying, wait a minute, that can just come down through me and I can give that to other people in the same way. Oh, yeah. Just, 
I mean, uh, duh, you know, like <laughs> when are you going to get that? But uh, yeah, so that's great, great um, thing to re realize. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but that's okay. It takes care of itself, doesn't it? That's right. It does it. <laughs> Life does it. And and I love that part of of the whole um, exploration that Jean did is that understanding that it has to come that we don't do it, life comes through us, that life does it. I just want to share, that's a very interesting, I just read the story in Chinese, translated by- um, Vivian, I right? Vivian, yes. I, I just read it yesterday. So it's just wonderful that, the, that you refresh this, um, read this article, <laughs> this, this story again and that uh, brought up a lot, you know, I, I kind of suddenly awakened <laughs> by, by this felt sense and what you have shared. And then we are in our breakup group is so intimately connected. Um, mm. Yeah, it's like a different, different realm, like one <laughs> kind of like changed. A different, a different realm. Say a little bit more about that, Bingwei, the different realm. The trusting of that interconnectedness of that uh, complexity and the capacity to, to trust that uh, the words will come out. <laughs> I was almost left. <laughs> so after I, I listened to this, I, I will go. <laughs> but I stayed and then opened my camera. So, so it's kind of like open up. Uh, I really appreciate this, whatever happened. Wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so glad that... Uh, that uh, you read that story in Chinese. We're going to have our China class tomorrow um, that a couple of people here from this group are in that class and we're going to be um, talking about that story in the class. Wow, so, that's amazing. That is, I just, I don't know what connection I got to tap into today. <laughs> but come in. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanna mention that and I had a wonderful experience with Lenore uh, just now, um, one of the things that came up was the difference between life experiences that can narrow our point of view and the felt sense, which can expand our experience uh, in any given situation. Yeah. So without focusing, I would have had my life experiences dictate how I think, what I saw, what I didn't see, so on and so forth. And so isn't it wonderful what focusing has to offer us is, is an expanse that goes against um, the narrowing of life experiences. I'm speaking for myself, but it might be true for others too. That's such a wonderful point, Bob, that uh, if we look at our life situation through the lens of the felt sense, it, it gives us a very different perspective than if we look at our life circumstance through uh, the narrow lens of um, trauma or narratives that uh, constrict us. Exactly. I could imagine, you know, the, the other way that, that Jean could have looked at that experience through a lens of, you know, the world is terribly dangerous and everywhere there is, um, is fraught with you know needing to escape i mean there could be many di different lenses and i'm not saying that some part of him didn't see that also but um but i think that's a great point and focusing focusing is a practice of looking at life through the lens of the felt sense that opens you up and it feels to me knowing this piece of his experience makes the knowledge of the felt sense and the wonderful gifts that are received from the felt sense even more meaningful and deeper yes. as a focuser. But I wonder if he had expressed that to the larger world, if some would have seen it or taken it or experienced it differently and if it would have affected his um, philosoph philosophical, the acceptance of his philosophical beliefs, and, uh, no, not beliefs, teaching, teachings, 
Whereas for us, it feels like it has so much more meaning to know where it comes from as, as focusers who understand the depth of what this felt sense can do for us. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It, it, it strikes me hearing Nancy's comments that, you know, our cultural moment, this is a time when this narrative is actually more uh, of a piece with the culture at large. You know, I did my somatic trauma healing training 20 years ago, and in, in the, the evolution in the culture is phenomenal. And in the last two, you know, two, three years, you can see the acceleration like this of, you know, there's all these social justice, you know, anti-white supremacy, somatic trauma healing things. It's the, it's, it's huge explosion of stuff. And so this story is just, it's just another story right now. It's no longer this, oh my God, how does this change Gene's teaching, right? It's, uh, it's the whole context of how this story lands is really different. Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting that the zeitgeist forms, but also produces what comes up. And that, um, that what's coming to us now as a community, the felt sense comes to the community, not just to the individual, is that, um, we, that we need to include the larger system, the social political systems within which we're embedded uh, in our understanding of focusing. And uh, it came through, um, through Amigo. I, I sent you um, Dave Young's quotes. Other people also are, are emphasizing this and that this story seems like extremely relevant to right now. It's about, um, accepting trauma and letting it go. And it's also about um, what the more is of the trauma. Is there, is there something that inspires us or puts us in connection with larger systems inherent in the trauma? And that's Jean's thesis that every bit of human experience has forward movement in it, potentially. I think I just want to say that every time you say the word more, it does something inside to me. It is an opening and it, it does really invite something, you know, in, invites me to see the more. And mm -hmm. because otherwise it's like, this is just what it is, but there's something about that word. And every time you say it, it just like feels like an invitation. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because then that enhances the word for me too. That when a word is special to someone else, then I, it's like they picked up a beautiful shell from the sand and, and then, oh yes. The word more is a wonderful word, that there's always more. It almost describes what focusing is, that there's always more, we're looking for that more. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing some more intimate. This is Sophie. Hi. Thank you for sharing some more personal, intimate life experiences with Jean and about Jean. It's um, always meaningful to me. And I kind of understand my way of understanding his not wanting to be public with this trauma fears. Um, I feel the same way with certain part of my trauma that I don't want this to be public. Um, and because I'm much more than that, but um, 
Yeah. Never know what's going to happen from the public realm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's a, there's a felt sense in that, Sophie, that, that I think adds to our discussion, the feeling of um, protectiveness of something that is so personal and precious. And yet Jane writes the story with such beautiful detail and brings us into it. It's so inviting. To want to ask him more. <laughs> now I, <can't. laughs> I have the fantasy that people who knew Jean, that we would get together on a Zoom call and share little details with each other, and then um, and then people could could watch that dialogue. So any of you who really knew Jean that would uh, would like to join me, Melinda, Steve, um, um, several of the others of you. Uh, we'll have a Zoom call and just share the little details that we um, that we know about Jean's life. We're going to say goodbye to you now, and we'll see you next Monday. Bye. And <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you once again. Peaceful week.